Hello everyone and welcome back to Orms TV. My name is Jess and if you have watched any of the previous videos on this YouTube channel, you may or may not be aware that among the other many things that I do, I am a professional colorist and I also lecture post-production for video at the Orms Cape Town School of Photography. In today's video, I thought it would be super helpful for all of the aspiring colorists out there if I did a little deep dive into my top 10 things that you should know before diving into your next color grade. You could also think of these things as the 10 important things that every aspiring or wannabe colorist should know or know how to do. Without further ado, let's jump in to our first point. So our first point actually relates a little bit to science, more specifically the physiology of the human eye and how vision works. Our eyes are very sensitive to luminance and changes in brightness or issues with exposure. The reason for this is actually because we have 120 million rods or light sensitive cells at the back of our eyes. Now, in conjunction with this, our eyes are decent at detecting changes in color, but we aren't as sensitive to color as we are to luminance. And this is because our eyes have only 6 million cones or color sensitive cells. However, what does this mean in a more practical sense for us as colorists when we are grading? Well, what it does mean is that viewers are more sensitive to contrast and issues with exposure or changes in exposure between clips. And practically speaking, this is why we adjust the luminance of our clips first. We get that right with our contrast settings because our viewers are going to be more sensitive to picking up those issues. Our viewers are slightly less sensitive, however, to color-based issues such as matching between shots. However, this is not an excuse for sloppiness. Before we dive into our next tip, I'm very sure that you, yes, you, the person watching this video, have your own insights and learnings garnered along the way of your color grading journey. And if that is the case, I'd love for you to leave those in the comments below so we can all learn from your experience. So share your top color grading tip in the comments down below. The second thing that you should know, or my second tip to do with color grading, is about identifying your hero shots. Now, a lot of people don't realize this, but there's actually a whole lot of work that goes into a grade before you even get into your color suite or your editing suite and start touching the footage. And all of that sort of stuff, that pre-production that comes with color grading, that happens before you do any of the grading itself, can be referred to as grade prep. Grade prep includes things like watching through the entire project a couple of times, most likely. It includes noting any issues that you find, such as problems with exposure or different cameras, any um, sort of color cast issues, that sort of thing. But it also includes the noting down of your hero shots. Hero shots are always the first ones that you will grade. How you use them in a practical sense is you will use those particular shots to develop looks for the various scenes or for the project as a whole, and you'll send those off to your client to get sign off. And once they've signed off on those looks that you've created, you'll then take all of the other shots in a given scene and match them to the look that you've created in the hero shot. This produces a much more consistent end result rather than just grading your project from start to finish. Here are a few helpful tips that can help you to identify good hero shot candidates when you're evaluating a grade. Firstly, hero shots are always pivotal to the story. And while this is true across any edit, it is especially important if this is a narrative based edit. My favorite example that I always like to use when I'm talking about this in class is that shot, that one shot from the first Avengers movie. And you know exactly which one I'm talking about because it is a literal hero shot. It's the one where the camera movement kind of pivots around and you see all your heroes kind of come into scene and then have this magnificent moment where they're all together and it's the big reveal, Avengers assemble, all of that sort of thing. I can almost guarantee based on the significance that that shot holds and how it was going to carry that throughout the rest of the MCU as it unfolded, that that was one of the shots that was chosen as a hero shot for that given scene to create that look and set the tone for that entire section of the movie. But what about the instances where your video is not necessarily narrative driven? 
Well, in these cases, often your hero shot could be the opening shot, and this is particularly true if the editor has chosen a deductive opening rather than an inductive one. In other words, the video starts on a wide shot that shows a lot of the scene rather than a close-up that doesn't. If you don't know what deductive or inductive openings are, just by the way, you can check out our video on an intro to editing theory in the description of this video below. Finally, hero shots are, generally speaking, wider shots rather than close-ups. The reason for this being that your wider shots contain more elements and just a broader view of that entire scene in general. I've noticed anecdotally in my experience color grading that close-up shots tend to carry very extreme grades a lot easier than wider shots do simply by the fact that they have less elements in the frame and therefore there's less things to interfere with a very extreme grade. However, what you'll often find is that if you develop a very extreme grade on a close-up shot, you're gonna have a very difficult time matching your wider shot to that close-up because there's much more going on. So rather, go with a more moderate grade, develop it on that wide shot, and then match your close-ups to the wide. You'll find that you'll have a lot easier of a time. Now that we've kind of looked a little bit at the grade prep side of things, let's talk a little bit about some other stuff in your color grading application that could be incredibly helpful to you. And the first is a tool called the vector scope, which has many different functionalities, but one of them is to help you when you're working with skin tones. It's easy to get lost in color grading, only to resurface and realize that the perfect blue tone you've created in your grade has turned everyone into an extra in a James Cameron movie. One way to make sure you don't go off the deep end is to use the skin tone indicator on the vector scope tool to make sure that your humans still look human. In other words, that they have a healthy and relatively natural looking skin tone. On that note, another really helpful tool that can be found in most color grading suites and will allow you to take your grade to the next level is a qualifier. Essentially what this handy tool allows you to do is make a selection of certain colors based on their hue, in other words, what color they are, their saturation, in other words, how much color are they, how saturated or how intense is their color, and then lightness, meaning how bright or how dark that color is. In other words, it allows you to isolate those shades from your grade or to include them in your grade and leave everything else isolated. Number five, pay attention to the waveform. Sometimes when you stare at an image for too long, it becomes tricky to remember what looks right at all. The waveform tool is a really nice and handy way to keep you on track and can help you balance out your colors to look as natural or unnatural as you would like them to. Tip number six is remember that saturation is both a gift and a curse. Everybody loves a nice punchy image with vivid colors, but too much saturation is one of the easiest ways to break your footage. If you're not sure why that is, go check out our video on the digital imaging principles that apply to color grading specifically, and that'll kind of break that down for you a little bit more. Just be aware that certain colors don't hold up well if the footage doesn't come from a camera that costs more than most cars, and you will see it very clearly when you turn the saturation up too high. The other reason that I advise going easy on the saturation is that sometimes the emotional tone of your color grade doesn't justify or call for high levels of saturation. So my advice when dealing with this particular parameter is always to go a little bit easier unless your client asks you to go to an extreme. It's always easier to push your grade to a more extreme side after starting off more neutral than it is to make your grade super extreme and then have to dial back every single clip in your grade. Tip number seven is watch out for red just in general. In keeping with the last point, most cameras have a really tough time reproducing very saturated reds. This has something to do with how sensor technology works. The important thing to remember here is that you normally have a lot of room to manipulate things when it comes to your green hues, but the opposite of green, of course, is red. Thus, in grading, your reds will tend to fall apart faster than a rusk you forgot to take out of your morning coffee. So in a nutshell, go easy on the saturation values of your reds when you're grading something. Tip number eight is that curves can do a lot more than you might realize. Most people know that if you make an S curve, it makes your image pop because this S usually means darkening your shadows and brightening your highlights. 
This is the same thing as increasing your contrast, which is something that a lot of people really like to do. But did you know that you can actually use curves on your individual color channels as well as just across the entire spectrum of luminance in an image? Red, green, and blue all have their own curves that let you individually adjust their tones and brightness. Just be careful that you don't get a little too carried away and turn everyone pink. Tip number nine has to do with shadows. Sometimes a grade is doing everything you want it to do, but your shadows have started tinting like crazy. A really useful trick is to remember that you can usually control the hue, saturation, and brightness levels of different values in an image in a less nerdy sort of way of putting it. This means you can individually desaturate just the low range of your image to make your shadows stay black without sacrificing any of the dynamic colors in the rest of your grade. If you do manage to do a look like this, it can look super, super cinematic and aesthetically pleasing. Finally, our last tip. It is very important for a colorist of any level to know how long a grade is going to take. And there's actually a couple of factors that you can analyze to try and figure that out. And we're gonna break those down really quickly. Here's a couple of helpful questions you can ask yourself during the kind of grade prep stage of your color grade that'll help you determine how long it's gonna take for that grade to be completed. And the first has to do with the project itself. What is the shot count? In other words, how many shots are there in the project? And what is the pacing? Is it fast? In other words, lots of short clips or slow with fewer longer clips. Both of these can take more or less time depending on how many shots there are or the complexity of those really long shots if there are only a few shots in the project. Another thing to consider is are there multiple different scenes? Next up is the client. First question to ask yourself would be, are they supervising you in person? And then the second would be, are you grading remotely? The first can take more or less time depending on what type of client you have. Sometimes when a client is supervising you in person, it can make the grade go faster, especially if they are super technical and they really know what they want and you guys can communicate clearly. However, sometimes it can take a little bit longer because they're looking over your shoulder and you guys are having to come to an agreement on what the look is going to be like. The same applies to grading remotely. Sometimes it can be a lot faster if you've just got the freedom to work and get things done and your client is readily available over some sort of digital messaging platform for you to get sign off on your looks. However, sometimes that's not the case and then it can take a lot longer because you're waiting for sign off and having to send things back and forth constantly. The next question to ask yourself would be how involved is my client going to be in the look creation process? Some clients like to have a very free hand with this and are very willing to just let you run with your own expertise and what you want to do based on a few gentle guidelines that they've given you. But other clients are incredibly precise and are going to want to sit there and monitor everything that you do and be super involved. And that can mean that it can take a little bit more time to find something that they're really happy with. And then finally, the last client related thing has to do with references. Sometimes clients will provide references for you to work off. This could be still images from the same shoot as the video that have already been graded by the photographer that you then have to match. This could also be shots from other videos or from films. Essentially, these are there to kind of guide the look creation process. Now, sometimes you'll get lucky and these references are very realistic and very achievable and something that you can roll out super easily. However, sometimes the references are unrealistic for various reasons and you might spend a bit of time trying to replicate them in order to show your client that it's not possible and this can slow down the entire grading process. We're gonna continue unpacking these points in a hot second, but before we do that, I wanted to just remind you that if you are really enjoying this video and finding it helpful and useful so far, it would be absolutely fantastic if you would give this video a like. It seems like a really small thing to do, but honestly, it helps us out so much when we're planning the content that we're going to make for all of you in the future because it lets us know that this is the sort of thing that you want to see more of. So if you do want to see more color grading content, give this video a like and we'll be sure to deliver on that. Next up, the level of difficulty, which has to do with the footage itself, generally speaking. Questions to ask include, is the footage quality poor? Are there major exposure issues? 
problems with noise that need to be corrected. Maybe there's a white balance or a color cast issue, or perhaps there's multiple different cameras that need to be matched in order to look the same, and that can cause complications. And finally, the last factor to consider is you, the colorist yourself. Are you really experienced? Or maybe this is your first grade. Obviously, the more experience you have and the more experience with working with that particular type of project and that particular client will make everything go faster. Whereas if it's a new type of job or a new client or you're just new to this in general, it's going to take a little bit longer. Then it also refers to your tech. What are you grading on? Is your machine that you're working with going to be able to keep up with the footage that you have been given and the speed at which you need to grade? If it isn't, if you're working on something like an older laptop, maybe with very intensive footage, say 8K footage, 10 bit, 12 bit, something like that out of something like a RED, it's going to take a lot longer because your hardware is going to struggle to keep up. Well, everyone, I really hope that you found this video helpful and informative and that you feel ready and prepared to get out there and tackle your next color grade with confidence. Just a reminder that if you're into this sort of content or just other videography and video editing related educational content in general, or maybe gear and you're really into the latest gear and gear comparisons, or even film photography. We create a lot of that sort of content over here on Orms TV. So you can hit that subscribe button and the notification bell if you would like to find out whenever we upload something new. Until next time, cheers.